I want to first uh, get started by saying it's very important that the uh, PSL branch in DC initiated this uh, discussion group. It's not possible to study too much. It's not possible to study specifically the works of of Marx and Engels and Lenin and all the other revolutionaries all around the world. And you know, after after the Russian Revolution, communism and Marxism, which had been birthed in in Europe, really becomes global, and communism starts to move to the east and move to the south. And there you have Ho Chi Minh and Kim Il Sung and Mao and the revolutionaries in Indonesia. And then uh, in Africa, Samora Machel, the leaders of the South African Communist Party, the, the revolutionary movements against Portuguese colonialism in, in Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, all of them led by Marxists, Fidel, Che, Walter Rodney. Um, you know, communism really goes from being a, a fundamentally European phenomena to fundamentally a, a, a phenomena that's driven by the, the places where the center of revolutionary gravity has, has sort of been dominant. And if Europe was the center of revolution at one moment with the French Revolution and before that, the so-called glorious revolution in England, which was of course not that glorious for Ireland or India, um, but there was the British English Revolution and the French Revolution. And then of course the Paris Commune of 1871, the Russian Revolution. But then you can see the movement moves to the East and to the South and away from Europe. Not that there's not a strong communist movement in Europe. And when we think of that and think of this book in particular, State and Revolution, this book in many ways uh, becomes the Bible for revolution, in, especially in the places where revolution happened, which was in fact not in Europe. It was in Asia, it was in Africa, there were, is in the Middle East, in, in Latin America. But there's a very big distinction between the way Marxists read Marx or Marxists read Lenin and the way Christians read the Bible or Muslims read the Quran. And that difference has to be really understood if we want to understand what Lenin's actually saying in a book like State and Revolution or any of his books. Um, the Bible or the Quran is according to the adherence of the faith, the final word. It's the, the dogma that represents ultimate truths, truths that uh, exist for all time. And there's nothing in Marxism that is premised on the words existing for all time as the word. In fact, everything about Marxism is basically a polemic. It's basically an argument that's taking place in the context of a society where there's political and class struggles. And in order to understand what Lenin is saying, it's, it's not to memorize his words and to repeat them uh, by rote as people might do say with the 10 commandments or the Bible or the Quran. It's to really get into Lenin's head and to understand who he's fighting with and what's the point of the fight? What's the argument he's making? Lenin uses all kinds of, I would say somewhat exaggerated and hyperbolic language when he's attacking his, his opponents. Um, and, and sometimes some of that hyperbolic language has you know, come into the movement where people end up calling each other names. And, that too misses uh, a, an essential point. Lenin wasn't really yelling at Kautsky, you are a renegade because that's just the way he talked. He was in a battle for leadership within a movement. And Kautsky had been the premier Marxist theoretician. And everyone looked to Kautsky, who was the leader of the, the theoretical leader of the German party, which was the flagship party in the in the Second International. And Lenin looked to him too. 
But this book was written really as a polemic against Kautsky because at the time that World War I starts, Kautsky and the German party, which just remember, just to put this into perspective, they have one third of the seats in the parliament. They have one third of the seats in the Reichstag. The German socialists are the biggest party in Germany by 1910. And Kautsky is the, the student of Marx and Engels and older than Lenin. And he's the theoretician for not just the German party, but for everyone. And World War I breaks out and all the parties of the second international, the socialist international, again, where Kautsky is the theoretical leader, all of them who have vowed that once a world war between the capitalists an inter-imperialist rivalry between these marauding predatory imperialists who are the colonizers of the world, who have colonized in fact the entire world, when they go to war with each other for the redivision of the world, for the redivision of colonies and semi-colonies and spheres of influence and markets, the communists, the socialists of all these countries vowed, we won't go and kill our fellow workers in other countries. We won't do that. We're gonna stay true to the idea that workers of the world should unite rather than kill each other, that we shouldn't be dragoon be behind the the elites of our own nationality and tell, look, remember first and foremost, you're a German or you're French or you're an American. They had all vowed, we're gonna say first and foremost, we're workers, we're part of a class and our loyalty and our patriotism is to our class, not to our bourgeois state. And yet when the war starts, all of them capitulate, not all of them, but most of them. The Bolsheviks don't capitulate and their representatives in the Duma, the sort of fake parliament that the Tsar allowed to come into existence after the 1905 revolution, those guys are taken out and put on trial and they're facing the death penalty. And all of the other leaders of the Bolsheviks are imprisoned or killed or sent to Siberia. And meanwhile, the socialists who support the war they can keep functioning. They can hand out their newspapers. They can have meetings at their offices. They can continue to recruit. They can demand higher wages for the working class, better benefits, better conditions, as long as they go along with the imperialists at this critical moment of the war. And Lenin was at first shocked. He was stunned. He actually didn't believe about the capitulation. He thought it was like a made up story in a bourgeois newspaper to to confuse the left. But within a couple of days, he realized it was true. And so Lenin begins this exploration of how could it be that this very powerful worldwide socialist movement would capitulate and give up all of their principles um, when, when war starts. And then he begins a deeper examination, not only why did they capitulate, but what's the source? What's the origin of their opportunism? Because it wasn't just the Germans and it wasn't just the French, it was the global phenomena. I mean, the Bolsheviks stayed true and they were repressed. The Serbian Socialist Party stayed true. Of course, Eugene Debs in the United States at age 66 was sent to hard labor for 10 years uh, for giving a speech against the US entry into World War I. So it wasn't like everyone capitulated, but most did. So Lenin begins an examination of reformism and opportunism within the left to try to understand how this thing happened, this catastrophe. I mean, it looked like the end of Marxism. All the workers who were socialists picked up the gun and went and shot their other socialist workers from other nationalities. And like Lenin does this deep, examination and investigation. And in the course of it, he re-examines what their views are towards the state and also their view towards revolution. Because the opportunist reaction to the war hysteria isn't disconnected from, their, from the absence of a revolutionary orientation in general. It, it shows, in fact, that they are 
opportunist and not revolutionary at their core. And so when you read State and Revolution, you have to understand the polemic, like what's going on. And so in, in December 1916, Lenin is in exile. By the way, this was a year before he's head of state, right? The year before he's the head of the new Russian revolutionary socialist state. And he gives a speech to some students in Europe. And he says, well, I might not see revolution in my lifetime, but I'm going to keep fighting so that all of you, all of you young people can pick up the banner and keep fighting. Uh, that was like November 1916. And a year later, the revolution has happened twice in Russia. And Lenin is, in fact, the head of state of a revolutionary government. It shows the, the dynamism of what can happen and how things change so dramatically and so quickly. And so it's not really an anticipation of the revolution. He's, he's hoping for a revolution, but certainly not confident in it. And when he begins this study of the state in a, in a library in Switzerland in December, 1916, November, December, 1916. And he goes back and he reads everything that Marx and Engels wrote. And when he did, does this, and this is before, of course, before the internet, it's not that easy to read everything from Marx and Engels. Much of what they wrote was not even published at that time. So it wasn't easy. I mean, you know, Marx and Engels wrote the, the book, uh, Critique of German Ideology, and then Marx actually lost the manuscript. Uh, he said, it, he subjected the manuscript to the gnawing criticism of mice, which was almost literally true because uh, it was only found, you know, what, years later after his death in his attic. And like Engels had been furious, like you lost our book. Anyway, my point is, um, Mark, to which Marx said, don't worry about it. It was mainly for self-clarification anyway, which was typical of Marx. But, um, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's an arduous task to read Marxism. So he goes into the library and he spends two months there. And by reading it, he's, he comes to the conclusion that everything that the movement has been talking about regarding the state and the prospects for revolution has been basically distorted and made into a reformist doctrine. And Marxism, and this explains the opportunist capitulation at the beginning of World War I, Marxism had ceased to be a revolutionary doctrine that in the hands of the socialist international, the social democratic parties that were winning seats in parliament, that Marxism had really become in essence stripped of its revolutionary core. And to understand who Marx was and Marxist thinking and Engels thinking, you had to go to the core and the core is what their attitude was on the state. And what this book says in short is that you, the revolutionaries cannot take hold of the, red, the already existing state and use it for socialist purposes. And that in fact, there's a big misconception about what the state is. We think of the state as frequently the two houses of Congress, the Supreme Court, the president, in other words, the governmental or bureaucratic apparatus. And there is an element of the state which is located there. But what Marx and Engels were saying and what Lenin sort of rediscovers in Marxism is that the essence of, this, of, the, of the state is not the government or the various forms of governmental rule. The essence of the state are the instruments of coercion and repression in society. He says the state is in its essence, bodies of armed men, meaning it is the military, it is the cops, it's the courts, it's the prisons, and that the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, the supremacy of the bourgeoisie ensconced in bourgeois laws that protect ultimately and always the rights of bourgeois private property against the interests and the democratic yearnings of the masses of people, that the state is really there always to defend and protect the interests of property. 
And in order to have a socialist transformation, the existing state can't be sort of taken hold of by like the socialists winning the majority in Congress or winning the presidency and using the existing state for revolutionary purposes. The state has to be smashed. It has to be destroyed. And a new state has to be created that ample, that, that reflects the revolutionary institutions, aspirations, values, uh, and especially the public ownership of the means of production, the making private property public property and reorganizing society fundamentally to meet the needs of the majority, to meet the needs, to ne meet the needs of the, the majority who are the working classes. And, and so it's extremely important polemic. You, you can read in chapter one of State and Revolution, he doesn't get to really finish his book because halfway through his writings, the revolution breaks out. So the state and revolution isn't really the guide to what happens in 1917, which of course must be studied also, where there's first a, a popular anti-Zarist re revolution led by the reformists, led by the groups that are still like Kautsky, uh, and then a second revolution led, re led by Lenin and the poor. It's the poor, it's the poorest workers, it's the poorest peasants, like the poor in society take over. And when they do it, they smash the old state and they create a new, so, a new state and all of the old police and military forces that were you know, elemental to czarism and then the provisional revolutionary government are shifted and a, a new state is created based on the needs of the people. And then when I go back to where and how the revolution spread to the east and to the south after 1917 and after the Lenin comes to power and says, we support the anti-colonial movements. We want the anti-colonial movements to smash the state too. We want the true liberation of the colonies. And so in China, all the young Chinese are like, yeah, we want to do what Russia did. We want to learn from Lenin. And the same in Vietnam and the same in Korea and the same in Indonesia, all over in the anti-colonial struggles. And this book becomes Again, as I sort of said, sort of frivolously, it's like the Bible of the revolution that moved to the East and to the South. This book that says you can't take hold of the existing state machinery and turn it into, a, into an instrument for revolution. You have to smash it and destroy it. And so you see the armed struggles break out in China, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in India, et cetera. And this, I, the idea of Lenin, the ideas that are sort of reorganized and re-explain the core of Marxism in its revolutionary essence, then educates a whole new, several generations, not one, but several generations of revolutionaries between 1918, all the way up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. This book is probably one of the most widely read books in the world for during all those decades. The Communist Manifesto, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, and State and Revolution were the only competitor books were the Bible and the Quran in terms of how many people read them. This, these ideas shaped whole generations of revolutionaries and became their compass and their guide. So I wanna, I wanna actually uh, stop because I want to leave enough time for Q and A, uh, and I had been asked to speak for about twenty minutes. So again, just to re repeat, when you read Marx, well, not as not as much Marx. Marx was like when Marx wrote Capital. He's get he's it's this arduous scientific study about the basic laws of capitalism. It's not really a polemic. It's really trying to get to the. The, the first unearthing of what capitalism is, but it has revolutionary conclusions, meaning that the proletariat itself is not simply a victim class. It's not only oppressed, it has the capacity to be the new ruling class, that it can take the power and that it can transform capitalism and build off of capitalism, not eradicate capitalism, but build on top of it 
and take the improvements in technology uh, and communications and industry and science and use it for the benefit of the majority rather than the, the 1% or 0.1%. So Marx, Marx is sort of, many of his works are polemical, but capital certainly isn't really a, a polemical work. It's a scientific work. But Lenin's writings are all polemical, all of them. Not, there's not one that's not. And in order to understand what he's saying, don't just try to memorize the words. You have to contextualize the battle he's fighting, the battle of ideas that he's waging at a particular moment. And uh, I think that ideas, once they become, you know, confirmed or, or embraced by activists and organizers and revolutionaries, those ideas become a material force in how, this, in how the struggle ultimately ends. If we don't have a clear understanding of where we're going and what we need to do, activism by itself is ultimately pretty meaningless. Ultimately, it doesn't transform society. There has to be consciousness and intentionality and direction. And when we read Marxism or Lenin's works or the other works of other revolutionaries, we recognize that these works are not doctrine that we just embrace unthinkingly. They are theory. And theory is nothing more than, than the generalized experience of earlier struggles of the oppressed against the oppressor. So all of the lessons that our class or the classes that are oppressed by the oppressors their struggles over the centuries are crystallized in theory. So it's not an academic exercise. It's not interesting. It is, in fact, the generalized experience for revolution. And that was the core of who Lenin was in the core of this book and all of his other books.